All right, if everybody will turn in their Bibles to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Um, I'm not usually one to preach a whole lot out of the Psalms. Uh, you know, it's one of those things I think they speak a lot for themselves, but uh, as I was thinking this week what God would have me to preach on, and uh, if, you know, if you're a Sunday school teacher and have to come up with a lesson every week, sometimes it's hard. You know, and as a preacher, it's the same way. And so we, uh, so I depend on God to, to guide me. In Psalm 100, as I was thinking of other things, I mean, I thought about Daniel and the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but, uh, you know, and a couple other things. And Psalm 100 was the only thing that God would give me any kind of peace about. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what I went with. And I think it, uh, I think it fits. I think it's uh, I think it's something that we need to hear uh, in, in this day and age and this time. So let us uh, read Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. But we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again we come to you, come before you. And Lord, before I start, Lord, I just I pray that every one of us here doesn't have any unconfessed sin or they've repented. Lord, that we can... We know you tell us if we regard iniquity in our hearts, you won't hear us. And Lord, I just pray that, that we hear you this morning. Lord, I pray that uh, none of these words are my own. Lord, I don't worry about what people hear what people think, what their perception is. Lord, that, that it's just your word. And Lord, we pray that, that we allow your word to touch us, to cut us deep. Lord, uh, a lot of times, especially in the New Testament church, we see that uh, uh, when people were preached to, it says they were cut to the heart. Lord, we pray that we allow the Word to do that, that we don't quench the Spirit. Lord, that uh, we are completely and totally obedient to Your Word and Your commandments. Lord, it's in Your Son's most precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so Psalm 100, as I was looking at it this week and I was thinking, you know, last week I talked about how we ought to be pouring ourselves out. We see the sin in the world. We see things going on and, and, and how, you know, a lot of times we just don't care. You know, and, and we looked at the Garden of Gethsemane and, Je and Jesus, what he was going through as he was praying, you know, not only for himself and what he was supposed to do, but he was praying for us. You know, the, the recipients of the act uh, of the goodness, the kindness that God was about to bestow. You know, the, the recipients of, of Jesus going to the cross. Now, you know, I, I almost say that I doubt God uh, or Jesus, the Holy Spirit, got any uh, personal satisfaction, any personal benefit out of Jesus going to the cross. You know, Jesus didn't do it for himself. It was all for us. And so he poured himself out in the garden. He poured himself out on the cross for us. And, and as we look at the world around us today, a lot of people get upset. They get down. We, we focus on the negative things. And, and it's hard not to. And I, and I mention every once in a while that I learn a lot from my kids, especially my daughters. And, you know, I, I want to use Sarah for an example. You know, because, you know, me and my wife, we'll sit on our front porch and we'll talk and, and we'll talk about, you know, this Supreme Court decision or this uh, crime that happened and, and just talk about how messed up the world is today. And then I think about Sarah, and she doesn't see that. She doesn't worry about that. You know, she, she's one of those girls, she's all about flowers and butterflies. You know, and, and, and I look at that, 
And, and I think, you know, she looks past all the negativity. You know, and, you know, whether it's uh, on purpose, whether it's accidental, I think there's some, some purpose there. Before, we, before they go to bed every night, the, me or their mama prays with them. And a lot of times they'll recite Psalm 100. Now, if they're going to recite it, most time their mama has to do it with them because I ain't got it memorized. But, you know, Sarah does. You know, she's five years old, has Psalm 100 memorized. And you know, I was going to try to get her to come up here and recite it, but she wasn't having no part of that. She's a little bashful. Now, if it was Savannah, she would have done it. But what I'm getting at is, you know, maybe there's something to her focusing on Psalm 100 that much. As we see the words to it, and, and praising God, and I'm telling you, some things that come out of her mouth sometimes about Jesus and, and how she loves Him, it amazes me. And, and so, I, you know, there's something to studying God's Word. There's something to focusing on things like Psalm 100. You know, I think it was Paul told Timothy, he said, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, focus on these things. You know, we have a lot of people, and it's easy to get caught up, because I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm as bad as anybody else. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll preach, and I'll a lot of times focus on the negative things that are going on in the world. But you know, when we do that, that's a lot of earthly-minded thinking. You know, and I think that's kind of the part of the gift of Psalm 100. You know, as we are told to keep our mind on heavenly things, not earthly things. And, and I think it's easy to get caught up into that because last week, as I talked about in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying that the, uh, that the disciples do not enter temptations. And, and what are temptations? They're distractions. Things put here by the devil to keep us off what our goal is. You know, like Robin mentioned, the Great Commission. You know, I look at my children and I see, you know, I said, Sarah, she'll recite Psalm 100. I don't know if y'all could hear it, but when we said the Lord's Prayer, Savannah said it with every one of us. You know, if was able to do that. She's three years old. And, you know, it's not that they're just so young and innocent that they, that they just don't see the negative things in this world and they're not impacted. You know, I think it's by design. You know, they don't see that. They don't focus on that. Now, I will say Savannah is a little bit dramatic, you know, and so she, she can be a little diva. But for the most part, I don't know if you watch her. She's sitting up here. She's waving. You know, she doesn't, you know, we have to have that mindset. Jesus commanded that we become as children. You know, and, and, and have that childlike faith. And, and a lot of times I equate it to believing beyond any kind of doubt. Believing that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, for us. But I also think it's focusing, believing, having that, that innocent mindset. You know, I think Psalm 100, as we look at it, is something that we have to remember as we endure these storms here on earth, this, this, this life that, that we have to live for a specified amount of time before Jesus comes back or before we're called home. And, and, I, and I look at, you know, I look at Scripture and, and storms come to mind as far as what we are going through today. Uh, what things are happening. And, and I think about Jesus as He calmed the storm. You know, He's asleep. He's not worried about the storm. He's asleep in the bottom of the boat, but yet the disciples, they're worried about it. You know, they go to Jesus and say, Hey, aren't you, we might die here. And here you are asleep. What was Jesus focusing on? You know, He wasn't focused on the storm. You know, he knew everything was all right. And all he had, he got up, and I can imagine his attitude. You know, golly, y'all have little faith. Peace be still. And he goes and goes back to sleep. And they're amazed. And why is that? Because as Jesus gave us an example, he wasn't worried about the things here. Now, granted, there's things that go on that they warrant our worry, they warrant our thought, our consideration. That we have to think about, we, as Christians, how do we respond to this, 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 and this? But when we look at that as how do we respond, we've got to be looking to God. You know, we've got to be looking to heavenly things. And so as we go through these storms here on earth, and, and we see that many men and women in the Bible went through storms in their life. 
I mean, do, do we see any inkling that, that Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were worried when they were being punished? You know, as, they, as, as the three Hebrew boys, or they were older by this time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or by the Hebrew names Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah, as they're in the furnace, or as they're being led to the furnace, do they have any worry for the things of this world? Is there anything going on around them that has them concerned? No. They tell Nebuchadnezzar, they say, look, we're going to put it into the hands of God. Whether we perish, we perish. And it doesn't, when that, and when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace, what did he see? He saw three men and another one that had the image of the Son of God. They wasn't worried. I don't think Daniel was worried as he was in the lion's den. He went in. He, he had, we, we have to look at when we make our decision to disobey government or what have it, uh, as we disobey on a Christian grounds, we've got to be ready to accept whatever punishment the government decides to pass down. Daniel was that way. You know, we see a lot of people in the news that, you know, uh, civil disobedience, whatever you want to call it, on, on a religious grounds. When you do that, you have to be prepared to accept the punishment. You know, Paul did that. You know, that didn't keep him from preaching the gospel. He went through storms all around him. He was stoned. He was uh, bit by a poisonous snake. He had received stripes and all this, but he didn't focus on that. You know, he kept his mind on, earth, on heavenly things and didn't keep his mind on earthly things. And so... As these storms we go through, and, you know, David is a good example about going through storms and, you know, a lot of the Psalms it talks about how people are out to kill him. But in Psalm 107, 25, it says, For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. And so we see these storms around us. And the book of Psalms says God raises up the storms. You know, I always say there is a divine purpose. There is a divine will. And what things happen uh, a lot of times are according to God's will as far as he's, he's gave us up, I think, as a nation to our reprobate mind. You know, whether it be uh, any kind of sin. You know, sin in general. You know, I, and I'm not just talking about same-sex marriage. I was telling the teenagers it's nothing for people to have sex before marriage. Period. You know, it's nothing for them to have to come into school, whether it be Planned Parenthood or whatever, and talk to 13, 14, 50-year-old kids about protection. You know, and that's a shame. You know, and it's not just sexual in nature. It's just the things that we see that people don't care about people anymore. And, and so... We see these storms, and as God has given us up to our reprobate mind, I think He's made some things take place to make us think. You know, in these storms, as, as we trust in God, and, and, you know, like I said, we see Jesus as He calmed the sea. We look in the book of Nahum, which that's one that's quoted quite a bit, huh? Nahum, verses, or chapter 1, verse 3 says, The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So he provides, you know, he, he has his way in the storm. You know, as we go through these storms here on earth and go through the, these things, he's going to have his way. And that's, what the, that's all there is to it. And then if we look at Isaiah 4, 6, it shows he provides shelter for us. It says, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. So as his people, his sheep as we're called uh, in, in Psalm 100, he will give us a shelter. You know, as we go through these storms and like we focus on these storms, but we don't focus on the care of God. You know, we don't focus on how God will take care of us. We sing at Him a lot of times, God will take care of you. We look in Job chapter 10, verse 12, and He says, Thy care, or it says visitation in the King James Version, but it's, Thy care hath preserved my spirit. You know, and Job had just got through saying that he was poured out like milk, but he's telling God, that, Look, Thy care has preserved me. 
And so as we look at the things around us, and I look at Psalm 100, this is a command to praise God in all this. You know, we a lot of times focus too much on the negative. You know, we are called to praise God. There's two, there's two psalms that's basically titled a psalm of praise. I think it's Psalm 100 and Psalm 145. And they easily, a lot of times, we can uh, get lost in the shuffle. We can memorize them. Uh, but if we don't live by them, what good does it do? And so that's why, you know, I've been guilty of this myself is focusing on the, all the negative things and not focusing on who is in control. And that'd be God. You know, not focusing on me needing to praise God. You know, I, I look at... Uh, you know, I look at a lot of the, the controversies that come up, and one of them's about the rebel flag. People, people don't, uh, you know, nowadays, they're even taking it off the, the Dukes of Hazard and this, that, and the other. I think it's a little bit blown out of proportion, but here's the thing. I think it's blown out of proportion on both sides. You know, there's a lot of people out there protesting, wanting to be able to keep the rebel flag, and if they would respond to that, if they would put that kind of effort into praising God as they do as praising the Confederate flag, you know, I think we'd be a lot better off. You know, this, these are things that, you know, we as a society as a whole have got our priorities messed up. You know, these are Christians that are, <coughs> they'll go protest and, and wave the rebel flag. And like I said, it doesn't offend me. I used to have shirts with it and everything. But here's the thing. You know, if we would put that kind of effort into praising God, into serving Him, into coming in His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise, if we put that kind of effort, as we do a lot of other things, I think a lot of the problems with this world would be better. That there would be um, there would be some relief to the problem of sin. You know, we have to remember that our focus is is, is in heavenly things. You know, and I think as, as we as, as Christians are being looked at and, and we supposedly set the example, that's what people need to see of us. That as we go through these storms, as, as everything goes to pot around us, instead of just complaining about everything going wrong, but we still praise God. Psalm 116. Seventeen through nineteen, it says, "I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all His people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord." So this is David saying, "I will pay my vows in the presence of His people. People need to see us praising God. People need to see us being obedient to God." You know, there's a lot of Christians that went out and protested on, on certain issues. They'll be in front of the courthouse. That is all they see of the Christians. They don't see them praising God. They just see them complaining. Period. You know, and like I said, I've been just as bad. And, and so as we look at the things going on, as I talked last week, we need to pour out ourselves. But I ended with Psalm 43.5 where it says, Hope in God. You know, Psalm 100 is a command to praise and put our trust in God. And, and as we look, you know, as it's broken down, you've got, you've got calls to serve, and then it shows why we should serve, and then it's got calls for praise, and it shows why we should praise. And, you know, as we're consumed with all this, you know, well, I think we need to look, especially, you know, verse 1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. And, and this make a joyful noise literally means shout and most of all people that th they see christians they're shouting from a picket line you know from a protest line and not praising god you know we are called to shout joyfully to the lord you know that and and this is where i say it's not conditional this ain't okay if you're going through this you don't have to shout if you're going through this you don't have to serve if you're going through this you don't have to praise it says all ye lands. It's saying all ye people. Everybody. You know, God doesn't put conditions on His commandments. And I look at Psalm 100 as a five-verse commandment to praise God. 
to serve Him. You know, and there's no conditions on it, but yet we put conditions on it. You know, we, no matter what we got going on, we may watch the news right before we get into church and, and we see a lot of bad stuff going on and we go in and say, you know what, I just don't feel like saying. You know what, I just don't feel good. I'm just going to take today off and show up and, and not give nothing to God. You know, we'll sit here and we'll let the outside world affect us and take our praise, rob us of our praise. Rob us, of our, rob us of our worship. You know, we're called to serve the Lord with gladness. Come to His presence with singing. You know, and we let all these things, and, and whether it be the things we see on the news or whether it's just things in our life, you know, whether it be our health, our, our family life, our kids won't listen. We let that affect our worship. And we're called by God, no matter what's going on, to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, to serve me with gladness, to come into my presence with singing. You know, and, and I'm one, as, as we look and, you know, you go on to verse 3, and what are those causes? Why should we do this? Why should we not be affected by all these things around us. And that's because if we look in verse 3, know that the Lord is God. You know, to me, that's pretty simple. That's pretty straightforward. Know who has our hands, who has their hands on everything that goes around us. You know, and we'll say that God's not in it. And, and in a sense, that may be true. But when it comes to ourselves, how we associate with it, God is in it. You know, as we talk about Him living inside of us, you know, that shows that God is in us and, and we are in the world, just not of the world. God is in this through us. And, and we are called to act certain ways. You know, if we, if we talked about, you know, we see a lot of preachers that, that uh, they'll just say God loves you, God loves you, there's no hell, or God won't condemn you. There's a lot of preachers that do that. But we've got to, as, as ministers, as preachers, that's all of us, we've got to show all sides of God. Yes, there is judgment, but God has things taken care of. You know, we, we put our trust in God. I've, I've said this story before that uh, me and my wife sold a, a, a little was a sewing machine, a desk or something to this woman. I couldn't even tell you where her house is now. But she lived by herself. And, and as I walked in, and I think it was like $100. And she's like, let, let me see. Me and the Lord have got it here somewhere. You know, and I look at that as a prime example of, of somebody putting their complete trust in God. No matter what's going on around them. And, and we have failed, I believe. I, I, I don't believe it, I know it. Because there's a difference in belief and no. I can say I believe in God. And, but belief has kind of been cheapened in a way. I know there is a God. And I know that through His divine providence, He's in control. And, and, you know, and I, I do myself a disservice in the people around me if I'm not praising God continually. Because if I'm not, what does that say about my belief in God? Do I completely trust Him with my life, with my situation? You know, it says, It is He that made us. We are His. We are not ourselves. This is not something... We don't get through this on our own. We don't become saved on our own. You know, that's a message that a lot of people preach. <coughs> and, and I've talked about this in the past. Is that, And we watched this at the men's meeting last Wednesday night. And... If you don't go to the men's meeting, I suggest, not only is the food good, thanks Liz this week, that was good, not only is the food good, but, I mean, we really dig deep into some things. And, and a while back, there was a woman that got on TV that said, you don't come to church for God, you come for yourself. You, you don't obey God for God, you come for yourself. And, it, and I'll tell you who it was, it's Victoria Osteen, it's Joel Osteen's wife. So whatever you think about Joel Osteen, this is what she said. And, and I remember seeing it and being taken aback from it. Now, basically, you come to church for yourself. You obey God for yourself. And then, but if you get into 
some of the cults and what Satanists uh, actually teach and worship is their self. You know, that's the message they preach. They don't really worship Satan. They worship self. You know, they, it's greed. Anything to put yourself above everybody else. And, and that's, what some, that's some things that's coming out of the pulpit. And we've got to remember, we don't do this ourselves. This is all God. This is God, you know, putting His hand on us. And, and you know, we are responsible for how we respond in certain situations. And, and what we need to do is we need to respond by trusting in God because it's He that made us. We are His people. You know, the sheep of His pasture. And we can look at, you know, John 10 talks about Jesus being the good shepherd. You know, look at Psalm 23, and we see the relationship of a shepherd. You know, and we are his sheep, we are his people, and what do we do? What, do, what happens to sheep if they go on on their own? They get eaten. You know, that's, that's the truth of it. I've, and now granted, I don't, I've never known there to be a lot of sheep around here, but you don't hear of wild sheep. You know, you've got bighorn sheep. You know, that's a totally different species. You, you don't, you know, you can see hogs. They can go out and become feral. They can escape and become feral hogs and become wild and they can live like that. Sheep can't. We can't live on our own like that. And so that's where we go back to things like Psalm 100 and know that God is God and that we have a responsibility to praise Him, to stay by Him, to follow Him, to follow in His footsteps. You know, Psalm 119.73 says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Psalm 139.14 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are His workmanship. You know, that's a common thread through Scripture that says, Hey, this ain't us. This ain't about us. This is about God and our relationship with Him because He made us. You know, in the book of Romans, I think it's chapter 9, talks about how we are clay. You know, and how there's vessels of honor and dishonor. You know, and how are we going to honor God? By continually praising and, and you know, making a joyful noise. You know, these last two verses, 4 and 5, and it, it's a call to praise and it shows the reason for a praise. And, you know, as we look at, you know, when this was written, David was writing the psalm and they had the temple and it was a big ordeal. And, you know, and that's... <coughs> At that time, what he was talking about when entering into his gates, entering into his courts. But as we look at today, you know, there's no temple. We are the temple. You know, Paul teaches that we are the temple of God. As we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, as God dwelled in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And so we are that temple. And so as when we wake up in the morning, when our eyes open, we're entering into his gates. When we walk out of, the, out of the house, we're entering into His courts. So we're called to praise God, not just in church on Sunday morning. You know, as we go throughout this week, whatever it may be, wherever we may be at, people should see us. You know, there's nothing wrong with going through the grocery store singing a hymn. You know, I saw a video a while back, and it's this guy. He's sitting in a doctor's office. And I can't remember what song he was singing. I want, I want to say it was Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and that may be because we just sung it a while ago. But he was singing a hymn and blessed the people around him. You know, and we have that opportunity. We don't have to ask or pray for opportunities. God gives them to us. God gives us the opportunities to touch people's lives every day. Whether it be us, whether it be our own, whether it be other people that we don't know. You know, we have those opportunities. You know, me and my wife have been stopped in restaurants because people see us ask for a blessing on our meal. And that's, that's not a big sacrifice you make. You know, to stop and ask for a blessing for your food, but yet that blesses people. It's not hard. You know, and God gives us those opportunities, and whenever we can, we need to praise God. And people need to see that. That's something that the world needs to see from the church today. You know, as we looked in verse 3, and it says, Know that the Lord, He is God. And we go to verse 5. 
It says, for the Lord is good. And He is. But, you know, we look at why is the Lord good. And we continue on in the verse, and it's because of His mercy and because of His truth. I'm going to go with them backwards here a little bit, but the truth of who He is. You know, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. You know, the, the one that sent His Son to die for our sins to redeem us. The sustainer that builds us up. That's, and that's kind of what I've been talking about is, you know, we need to let God sustain us through these times as we go through things and we see these storms all around us. We need to look to God. You know, we don't need to look to no president. We need, don't, don't need to look to Congress or Supreme Court because we see they fail. But we need to look to God. You know, and, and as we do that, we recognize who God is, that He is this Creator, Sustainer, Redeemer, that He can take care of us. You know, and, and as, we, as we go through time, people are going to try to change what the truth of God is. You know, we see the question that Pilate asked Jesus. He said, what is truth? I mean, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the truth. You know, and so as we, as we go through all this, you know, why is the Lord good? It's because His mercy and truth. And, and no matter what happens, you know, God's truth will stand. Romans 8, 28. That's familiar to a lot of us. It ought to be anyway. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are who are the called according to His purpose. So as we see these storms going, around, going on around us, all that works for good for who? For those that love God. You know, and do we love God this morning? Do, do, we, do we put our hope and our trust in His truth, in His mercy? We better, because we wouldn't be nothing without His mercy. And His mercy wouldn't be nothing without His truth. If He, if he wasn't who He is, His mercy wouldn't mean nothing. Hebrews 13, 8. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. You know, that is, you know, as it talks about his truth and his mercy endureth to all generations. You know, Jesus Christ doesn't change. You know, he's still the same Savior that was on the cross. And we owe him that praise. You know, we owe him the honor that goes with being able to create this world. We owe Him the honor that He died for our sins. And, and we, as, as Paul put, re-crucify Him. Because we don't show true repentance and we don't live like we know Him. Because people don't see us praise God. Romans 20, or not Romans, but Psalms 25.10 says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. The paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. You know, God never said it would be easy. He said there would be storms. But regardless... In those storms, we're called to praise God. And, and if we keep His covenant, if we keep His testimonies, that's what a testimony is, is our praise of God, what He's done in our life. If we keep those, it says our ways will be mercy and truth. Not easy, but mercy and truth. So as Cleet and Cheryl come up for the invitation before we take part in communion, you know, this... I want you to think this morning, you know, do you praise God enough? Do you give Him what we owe? You know, and I've talked about it before, and, you know, we don't praise God enough. You know, we, you know, there's churches around this country that you can walk in and, you know, I don't know if they love God. You know, because you, you can't tell it. They're not happy. We should be happy. You know, because no matter what goes on around us, no matter whether we got physical ailments or whether, you know, you're a Republican and hate that Barack Obama's president, no matter what happens, we should be happy. You know, it's, it's that simple. You know, whether you're, 
you know, Democrat and all the, you got Tennessee's got a Republican governor and a Republican House. You know, these things are inconsequential. What's consequential is how we react. And are we going to act with praise or are we going to act with complaint? So this morning as we stand to sing, you know, what, how are we living? You know, as we look at the communion, this shows that who God's truth is. How are we going to react to the things around us? Are we going to praise? Are we going to complain? Let's stand and sing.